We just heard you talking about the history of Sudan to explain how the, the neighborhood resistance committee started. Could you please kind of repeat that again? You said there were three military coups, three uprisings, and how did that all lead to the revolution of December of 2018 and to the creation of these neighborhood resistance committees? Actually, the neighborhood resistance committee started in 2013. Uh, after the 2013 uprising and there was a massacre on the streets of Khartoum and other cities. More than 300 people uh, lost their lives. The previous two uprising in, uh, in 1964 and in 1985, uh, the Sudanese people were using trade unions to get rid of the dictatorships. And uh, in 2000, uh, in 1989, uh, the, <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the Islamists took over the power with a military coup, and they learned it from the history of the Sudanese uh, struggle, and they dissolved all the trade unions so as to deprive the Sudanese from the a traditional weapon that they used to get rid of the uh, dictatorships. In 2013, actually, the government uh, followed the uh, International Monetary Fund subscription and lift subsidiaries, and uh, people took out the street against this decision, and they have been killed. Uh, after the Islamists were successful on putting this uh, uprising of 2013 down, uh, here came the call for uh, forming the neighborhood resistance committees for, from the Sudanese Communist Party. And it started in 2013 as a, a neighborhood committees. Uh, the basic uh, work was uh, providing services for the neighborhood like uh, cooking gas uh, subsidiaries for the people and 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 other things the starting of this committee was in 2013 it is part of our culture in sudan that this neighborhood committee is not uh, an instruction from outside sudan that being people implement it but it's part of our culture that people they are gathering and they are helping each other most of the times. And 2013, due to the massive um, demonstration that happened during the regime time of Omar al-Bashir, people, they start to organize themselves to serve their neighbor and try to form a different kind of platform that people, they can, all of them, they can join. And it started from the grassroots movements and the participation was very holistic and very diverse. And it's built by a lot of challenges until 2016 so are being announced and 2018 but being leading the same group they're being leading the revolution in sudan and from that time up to today the resistance community has become our uh, strong body in sudan and our pillar of power the neighborhood resistance committees uh, kept developing uh, through the years and in 2016 uh, there uh, was a, a general disobedience and political strike. It was very successful in 2016 for three days. And here, the, this was a turning point in the history of the neighborhood resistance committees because the neighborhood resistance committees in 2016 started uh, playing a political role and also adopting uh, political views. And this kept developing until we reached the peak of the Sudanese people's struggle in 2018. And this was the uh, another turning point in the history of the uh, Sudanese revolution. Uh, in 2018, uh, the neighborhood resistance committees start organizing demos in different uh, places. Actually, the thing started 
away from the capital Khartoum it started from a very tiny uh, village in the south of the Blue Nile which is called Mairnu in the 16th of December and the things uh, kept developing it's like it was like a snowball and it continued for four months and there was a lot of repression uh, so many killings and kidnapping and arresting and forced disappearance uh, for the members of the neighborhood resistance committees uh, but eventually on april 2019 uh, the um, the military has no other options under this uh, under the pressure of the masses of the people uh, the, the military has no other option uh, than to uh, offset uh, President Omar Bashir and the Islamists and put him under arrest and form this uh, uh, military council. And uh, after the forming of the military council, uh, people uh, created this uh, what is called sitting area in the front of the army uh, headquarter in Khartoum and the sitting continued for two months and in the 3rd of June uh, the military council who overthrew Omar al-Bashir uh, decided to uh, to crush the sitting area uh, so there was a massacre which is known as Khartoum massacre and more than 3,000 person, person lost their life in this uh, crackdown of the sitting area. And from there also things developed again. And uh, there was a, a huge demonstration after uh, almost uh, 27 days of the uh, uh, of the massacre of Khartoum massacre and, and the 30 of June 2019 there was a mass demonstration millions of the Sudanese people took it out of the street despite that uh, there was no internet the military council shut down the internet there was no any means of communication, but people start communicating the message of uh, for the uh, demo of the 30 of June on the uh, walls, on the streets, writing, the graffiti, everything. This is how they spread the word uh, among the Sudanese people. So uh, after 2000, uh, after uh, 30 of June, uh, the military council was obliged to go and to negotiate and to form this transitional government for two years, uh, which is a, a shared power between military and uh, civilian. The civilian who formed this uh, government or who shared the the power with the um, with the military council. Uh, were mostly what is known in Sudan for the radical, I mean, the uh, soft landing wing. And uh, the soft landing wing uh, also played a rule uh, uh, that is dictated by the international community and they are considered for the radicals in Sudan and also for the neighborhood resistance committees as a counter-revolutionary, they are reactionaries actually, uh, but adopting uh, the revolution uh, slogans, uh, but eventually it turned out that they are uh, working as agents and compradors for the regional and international power. And you told about um, privatization and land grabbing. Mm. Can you just briefly <coughs> say a little bit more about the importance of that? Yeah. Um, 
Actually, the the Islamist, uh, the Islamist are considered as a capitalist, and I mentioned that the, in Sudan we have this a uh, new terms for for the for this kind of capitalist, which we call a parasite capitalist in in Sudan, and uh, the Islamist government uh, start privatizing, you know, the public sector, uh, especially the agriculture sector, and also the health sector and education sector. Uh, 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 it was the right for the old Sudanese before the Islamists uh, to receive uh, medical aid and uh, education for free, uh, but with the Islamists, everything being brought privatized. Uh, not only this, not only uh, the healthcare uh, sector or education sector, but also uh, the agricultural land. Uh, uh, it is well known that Sudan has the most fertile lands in the world, and Sudan has uh, more than. Uh, uh, 200 million fed dance of fertile land and uh, a land good for for agriculture. Uh, the Islamists grab the land uh, from the uh, uh, small farmers and also privatize a public sector in, agric in agriculture like the Jazeera scam, which is called Jazeera scam. The Jazeera scam is the biggest irrigated uh, agriculture project in the world. It is this uh, this scam is between the two Nile, between the Blue Nile and the White Nile. Uh, it has a huge size uh, of land, which is. Uh, Two million, two million fed down, irrigated, uh, a very systematic irrigation. And the Islamists privatized all this, and the land grabbing percentage in Sudan mounted to uh, forty-eight percent of the land, and all this land being sold by the Islamists to the. Uh, regional states like United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, and Egypt, and also uh, United States and UK and Germany and EU in, in general. I mean. um, <coughs> can you just briefly explain what led to the war in April of 2023? And what's the role that, that the neighborhood committees have today since the war? I think I think the war is is just a game. Because the two generals are wanted for committing crime against humanity is cleansing and war crimes in Darfur and also in Khartoum and uh, Along with the international power and interna uh, the so-called international community and the uh, regional power, uh, which uh, I mentioned now, <coughs> uh, they are trying, the international community is trying to keep it is comprados and it is agents in the power in Sudan. And the neighborhood resistance committee were insisting on holding the two generals, the leader of the militia and the leader of the uh, army accountable for their crimes. And the international community designed what is the, the what is called in Sudan or in the in the Sudanese politics as uh, a framework agreement and uh, framework agreement uh, intended to bring those agents whether they are civilian or 
from the military to the political scene again. And when the neighborhood resistance committees refused this uh, framework agreement, uh, so now the generals are warring in Khartoum. And I am saying this is just a game. Uh, why? Because uh, they want to bring the Sudanese people to the point that we just need to live in safety. We are not asking for democracy, we are not asking for uh, a better life, we are not asking for a better uh, education, we just want to save our lives. This is, I think, this is the main aim for this war. It's a, another obstacle in the course of the revolution, but the neighborhood resistance committee is fully aware of that. And from the first day of the war, uh, the neighborhood resistance committees released a press statement that this is not our war. It's not the Sudanese people war. It's the war of the two generals and let them fight. And who will prevail at the end, we will face the Sudanese people. You said that uh, the state doesn't function anymore, the state institutions are not running, and there are these emergency rooms everywhere. Can you please talk about that so we get an impression? Yeah, in fact, uh, after the outbreak of the war, uh, everything stopped. Uh, as you mentioned, and the government was not functioning at all. More than 90% of the uh, health and medical facilities were out of service and people were uh, suffering uh, from the wounds and casualties and also uh, dead bodies on the street and you know. Uh, so the neighborhood resistance committees uh, formed this what is called uh, emergency rooms and the emergency rooms is another step in the development of the neighborhood resistance committees. In 2023 now, the war started in April, there are who is doing the surf or who is do, uh, facing the challenges, the resistance committee, they become our uh, inter uh, alternative government for Sudan now. And, um, and overall Sudan, the resistance committee was being functioning. And during this, during this war also they are being working 24 hours. They are being replacing doctors. They are being replacing hospital because they do all the hospital or schools, yeah, like infrastructure was being damaged completely because of the war. Now they're taking, plus the initiative that they are being uprising during the war, they are cooperating together and working together for emergency room, doctor emergency room, uh, uh, food and sup water supplies, and also shelter for women. They are doing a lot of great work, and that is the, um, the outcome from the, the, the pressure that happened in 2013 and before that. These people now, they are united, and they are very strong. They have food and water supply room, they have emergency room, they have even safe uh, um, existence for people to leave the, the places when they have bump, you know, trying to check the neighbors also if they, ha if they don't hear from them for two, three days, also they go around uh, like a w small group to check the neighbors and also this kind of psychosocial support for the neighbors who are still remain in Sudan, they cannot leave the, the, the city where they have the bump or they have the conflict. This neighborhood community, because they have a bodies, they have people who are like a contact person, has been trust and have been also uh, nominated by the, the group. And they are knowing each other. If they have something, they just, the people or the civilian, they reach them. And they go to ask them, for example, one, two, three houses, they have no water, they have no food. And they are monitoring and evaluating the situation outside and then they try to bring this stuff. It's very risky, but they are taking the risk. And we appreciate that this, we still have this kind of young, strong people who can fight during the war for their needs 
and also try to support the other civilians. And it's really hectic, but we we have no choice. Uh, the 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 emergency rooms, for example, these uh, medical emergency rooms, providing uh, medical help for the people, uh, it is not so easy for them because uh, there is no uh, safe passages, so they have to manage how to deliver the aid to the uh, areas or hot spots. And if you see the media that the resistance committee is not being highlighted or being appreciated what they are doing, mostly that you can see in the public media or international media, the two general who are making the noise and fighting, they're being very famous, but in the ground they are those people who are saving the civilian now. And also there is this, uh, what is called agricultural emergency rooms. Uh, to save the uh, agricultural season. Um, uh, the Neighborhood Resistance Committee is fully aware that people who are losing their life due to famine and starvation is uh, much more than those who are l losing their life due to war. So the Sudan also is under threat of famine. But now the Neighborhood Resistance Committee is, is trying to save the agricultural season and also to create this uh, cooperative organization on the, uh, on the neighborhood. And uh, they are <coughs> trying uh, to, uh, to grow the sorghum which is the main food for the Sudanese people in the areas uh, like Gadarif, which is a rain-fed area. It's, it's not an easy uh, thing to do this uh, because uh, it's a huge step, I think. It's a leap jump toward uh, uh, shifting the agricultural workers from just workers to producer to owner mm, uh, through these uh, uh, cooperative organizations and also this thing will uh, minimize the uh, banking sector the banking sector is the biggest uh, uh, funder you know for the for the agriculture and actually they are not funding uh, the small farmers they are only funding uh, big companies who are uh, you know growing vast uh, lands in Sudan uh, so uh, this step from the neighborhood resistance committees will minimize the rule of the banking system in the agriculture uh, process so it is not an easy thing because we know that the capitalist will fight back not only the Sudanese capitalist but the international capitalism also uh, will support them especially uh, <coughs> uh, states like United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Qatar because they will be also deprived from uh, what uh, they uh, grabbed from the Sudanese land. You, you talked a little bit about how the um, uh, neighborhood resistance committees are organized locally and regionally, that there are delegate meetings or yeah. such like, things like that. Can you explain how they are organized on the different levels? Um, actually, each uh, neighborhood has it, it its own committee and uh, for example a city or a village uh, is divided into sectors uh, a sector might have uh, more than five neighborhood committees and each sector has its own coordination body and the coordination body is not a uh, delegated to make decisions is only 
to just to coordinate between the neighborhoods, the different neighborhoods. So uh, each district or each sector of the city or a village has its own coordination bodies and each group of sectors has its coordination body and at the end there is a coordination body for the whole city or a whole village. And each uh, neighborhood is an autonomous body. Uh, so it has the right to participate here or to refuse this or uh, yeah so there is no um, hierarchy on the neighborhood resistance committees the structure is not uh, vertical it's a horizontal structure and in the neighborhood resistance committees uh, there is no voting there is an ongoing discussion and people used to discuss and till everybody is satisfied and there is a, a common consent about whatsoever decision they, they are discussing. And what is the advantage of this form of a decision making and this form of horizontal organization in your view? I, I think uh, it has uh, a lot of advantages. Uh, for example, uh, there is no uh, concentration of power in few hands of the people, of people, and also uh, it keeps uh, every neighborhood resistance committee autonomous and uh, independent uh, but in coordination with with the other neighborhoods and uh, <coughs> of course also it has uh, uh, a negative side which is uh, uh, it takes so long sometimes to reach a decision but at the end this it's i think its advantages is more than it is um, disadvantages across the country there's more than 5200 neighborhood resistance committees in different cities in different villages everywhere the neighborhood resistance committees is a huge network uh, grass self-organized network it is huge and it start stretching and expanding after uh, 2016 as i mentioned before uh, but it, it expanded uh, for it is maximum i think in uh, 2018 2019 and um, what is your assessment of the uh, um, political situation that there is now? Will people win eventually or not? And what what is needed for the Sudanese people to win? What is needed for the Sudanese people to win? Um, actually, Sudanese people need support, uh, especially in this uh, humanitarian crisis which is now Sudan is witnessing and also the Sudanese people need from the international community to stop intervening in in the Sudanese politics and to stop uh, supporting dictators whether they are civilian or from the military uh, what we need is <coughs> from the uh, global leftist is just to spread the word and support and to put enough pressure on their governments to left to lift their hands uh, from the uh, Sudanese uh, internal politics. Uh, if uh, the international community uh, distance itself from supporting. Uh, these uh, dictators in in Sudan, I think the Sudanese people are able to deal with them. Do you have a call for our listeners, for our viewers? I call on the, all those who are hearing us, 
um, uh, to get some knowledge about what is going on in Sudan and to support the Sudanese people and to put also more pressure on their governments here or outside Europe if there is a listener from outside Europe uh, yeah, to stop intermeddling in, in Sudan uh, also the Sudanese people are in need for uh, medical help and now starvation is a big threat for the Sudanese people and we already in the fall season and if the agricultural season is not successful most probably millions of people will lose their lives. Our people will be dying because of the basic needs food, drinks, medicine. It's not our conflict, but we are paying the prices. You know, we lost our family, we lost our inheritance, we lost everything, but it's still there are people left behind. We don't like to lose, to lose them. We need to support them and we need to stand for that. And I think if you hear me, that one of the things that is make me really unhappy, the silence of the international community. And most of the time I hear that is internal conflict. Yes, internal conflict, but who's putting his hand inside this conflict? Who's supporting the militia? The international community, EU, Germany, one of them. I call on the uh, international organizations to deal with the neighborhood resistance committees because the neighborhood resistance committees now uh, are representing the Sudanese people, not the government, uh, not the official bodies. Uh, they are just thieves and criminals, and uh, uh, that's a thing that most of the uh, international organizations they refuse to deal with the neighborhood resistance committees because the neighborhood resistance committees are not registered bodies. So. Uh, um, I call on the international uh, organizations and other organizations to recognize the neighborhood resistance committees with it is emergency rooms and that is uh, very critical uh, for the success of the Sudanese revolution. I think.